All right, hello everybody. Welcome to your absolute favorite Bronze Age comic book podcast, Flea Market Fantasy. I am your co-host, Mike Owl, and as always, I'm joined by... Michael Dell of the LCS Hockey Radio Show. That's right, and this week we have a very special guest. I believe this is a record breaker, right? That's right. It's uh, it's a three-time winner of the Best Independent Book Award for his novels, Knuckle Down, Cage Life, and Sinner's Cross. And he's also the world record holder for most appearances on Flea Market Fantasy. Right. Seven. Miles Watson. Clap, oh, that. clap, clap. Yes, that's a prestigious award. You want to talk about prestigious awards right there? That's That's one. even more prestigious than the Toronto Film Festival. That's award. right. That's right. There you go, Miles. So <laughs> this week, I believe, uh, Miles, this was your pick, right? No, technically not. No, no. Yeah, technically oh. not. <laughs> okay, Here's okay. what the deal is. M- Miles knows himself some World War II and uh, war stuff because it centers across the, one of the novels that won the uh, aforementioned award. It's set in World War II. And so I said, hey, Miles, how about doing a World War II comic? And Miles suggested Sergeant Rock or the Ghost Tank, right? That's Ghost crap, two? though, because it's DC. That's exactly right. That's what I told him. <laughs> well, I would have said those. <laughs> so what we're going to do is Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos issued 98 from 1972. That's right. Mm-hmm. So my... So, Miles, when you were a kid, you you read a lot of Sergeant Rock and a ghost tank? I believe it's called Haunted Tank. Yes. Oh, yeah, well, um, either one. Either one. Yeah, <laughs> I heard yeah. it both ways. I read, I read a lot of those, and there were some others. I actually was visiting, my, was visiting my mom, and my brother had flown in from L.A. last weekend, and we went through the comic book stash, and he's been taking big heaps of them back, uh, back west with him. And I found even more, like, I found all these obscure World War II comics that I used to read voraciously for a time when I was a kid. I've forgotten most of the names, but the, like GI combat and stuff. Um, right. Stuff that I'd completely forgotten that I even owned. Oh. I I think the only war yeah, stuff I, I read was G.I. Yeah, Joe. Yeah. That was like a fake war comic. Yeah. Well, G.I. Yeah, Joe, uh, yeah, fake. It's fake war, but it's written by a real veteran. Oh, Larry true. Hammer. Yep. <laughs> Oh, can I? I know, I know, Mike Dell. You always enjoy my stories on Facebook. The latest thing I did was <laughs> somebody said that Mike, that Larry Hama hates white people. So I told him <laughs> to go back to 1860 where he belonged, and then I told him to fuck off. But I put a star in the U, so technically I didn't swear. But uh, Miles, you may not know this, but I've been kicked off Facebook twice in the last month. For I called, wow, wow. I called Axl Rose talented white trash. And I called uh, Kid Rock an inbred hillbilly. <laughs> so well, both yeah. of those statements are accurate. I know. But, I, I agree. But Mike L has a long history of getting involved in arguments, usually comic book based, and, and things get ugly. <laughs> so here's, not... here's a weird interjection because I have been on Facebook since 2006, and um, and I didn't actually start my own Facebook profile. That's a separate story in itself, but. I have been on Facebook technically since 2006 and I have never been banned or kicked off. And I feel like that's almost a mark of shame. Like I've never done anything interesting <laughs> well, enough on Facebook just, in all those years to be banned and kicked off. Like everyone I know has been shut down at least once. Just, uh, l- or, just follow Mike L's timeline in a little bit and you'll get in an argument with them and you'll get kicked <laughs> off. Wow. If you go on enough comic book pages, <laughs> I'm sure that it'll happen to you eventually, but yeah. yeah, because fandom's not toxic. Well, exactly. Say, get get on Facebook and say something bad about Quasar. There you Look go. Out. That'll get that'll rile <laughs> me up. That's for sure. Yeah. Mike will get very wow. fired. But uh-huh. today it's not Quasar, Mike L. It's no. Nick Fury, Sergeant Fury, and his Howling Commandos. That's right. Uh, issue ninety eight, and in this issue, really Nick Fury's not really in it that much. True. True. Yeah. Because yeah. I picked this one. Uh, because it's basically a ripoff of the uh, deadly do- or the the dirty dozen. Yes, dirty dozen. Because in the, in this issue, Nick Fury's right hand man, Dum Dum Dugan, gets put in charge of his own little uh, assault team of twelve ex cons. Well, I guess like nine ex cons, and they were like, wait, is, are there twelve with Dugan, or Dugan makes the twelve? I, I it's twelve. Be- yeah, with Dugan because he's part okay. of the picture profiles. All right, so yeah, so he's the leader, and then two guys came with him from the Howling Commandos, which was Nick Fury's squadron, 
and, and then the rest are all like convicts or they've been arrested in the military. There's like the kind of like the suicide squad or, or just a rip off of the dirty dozen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the writer here is uh, Gary Friedrich and the artist is Dick Ayers. Right. Dick Ayers. We'll talk about them a bit later. We've talked about Gary Friedrich before, but we'll get into Dick Ayers. Yes. But uh, Miles Watson, in all your war comics as a kid, did you ever read The Howling Commandos? I did read some, some Fury. I did. Um, I couldn't find any issues of it when I was home because I didn't know I was going to be on the podcast. I found some World War II stuff like the, what was it, the uh, Invaders? Yes. That's uh, Captain right. America and Submariner and the old yeah. Human Torch. Yeah, and uh, I, I had a bunch of those, actually. But uh, I did not find any um, any Sergeant Furies uh, from the Howling Commandos. Yeah. Now, Mike Gale, I'm, I'm going to guess you never read any, like, a bunch of war comics in the old days? Actually, no, almost none. Uh, other than the Nam from Marvel, which was drawn yeah. by Michael Golden, so. Yeah, that was uh, in the 80s, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, this one, 1972. So this series uh, was created by Stanley and Jack Kirby, and it was first published in 1963, and it ran until 1981. 167 issues. Wow. So that's pretty good. Um, the, the title came about from a bet that Stanley had with publisher Martin Goodman, because uh, Stanley said, we could come up with the worst title ever, and Kirby and I could still make it successful. So he <laughs> considered Sergeant Fury and his Helling Command as a ridiculous title, but I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's uh, not bad. But he says just the fact that it's so long and uh, th that he figured it was a terrible title, but they went with it anyway. And uh, Howling Commandos... Sounds to me, yeah, I go ahead, say, it actually sounds to me like a, like a band. Like uh, Sergeant like Pepper's like Lonely Hearts Club Band? band. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, well, Miles, he said he got inspiration for the Howling Commandos part from the old uh, the Army Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles. So that's how he came up with Howling Commandos. That's so kind of like the the generic title, like, the, like you go, you go, uh, you know, so like, have you ever heard of Mockbusters? You know, the movies that like they make, yes. the Asylum group makes, um, you know, Transformers becomes Transmorphers. <laughs> yeah. like that with the, the exactly title right. is always similar, but never as good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like the Howling Commander. Yeah. It's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Uh, so also an uh, interesting note, the Howling Commandos were a racially integrated unit. How about yeah. that? And this was rare at the time. And I guess uh, Stan Lee, in issue one, Gabe Jones, who's a black fella, he was colored Caucasian. Because the, the, mm. the printer didn't know. So Stan Lee had to put a note in with issue two saying, hey, no, 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 no. He's a black fella. Don't color him mm. like a Caucasian fella. So uh, that's something. And starting with issue 80, the title started alternating new issues with reprints. Mm. So that's odd. Very uh, odd, yeah. Stan Lee said they had to do it because they just couldn't keep up with the schedule. People wanted more Nick Fury stuff, but they, they just didn't have enough artists and uh, writers to handle the workload. So they just ran, put a reprint in there between new issues. And he said they sold just as well as the new ones. So <laughs> wow. they kept it rolling. And then after issue 120, it was just all reprints. So from 120 to 167, all reprints. Hmm. And I think 167 reprinted the first issue again. Um, so the main character here is uh, Dum Dum Dugan, like we mentioned. Mike L, do you know Dum Dum Dugan's real name? Uh, I mean, I think it's in this book, but I'm not going to cheat, so I can't remember it. <laughs> Timothy Aloysius Cadwallader Dum Dum Dugan. <laughs> really? Pretty, pretty long huh. name. Uh, he was a Boston native and a former circus strongman. And he was over touring Europe when uh, he helped uh, Nick Fury and... Captain Samuel Happy Sawyer uh, escaped from the Nazis. So then they recruited him to be part of the Howling Commandos. Hmm. Uh, um, any other notes? Hey, hey, Dum Dum, <laughs> Dum, Dum, Dum Dugan, Mike L. He, they, they like spun his history a bit then in, uh, more recently in the 2000s. But they said he actually died on a mission in 1966. And then Nick Fury, uh, he's like a robot. He's a Come life on. model. He's a life model decoy. That uh, Nick Fury put his consciousness, transferred it over. Because they say Nick Fury is still able to, you know, retain his, retain his youth because he took that, like, infinity serum. Is that what it's called? To keep uh, him young? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the reason Dum Dum Dugan is still around is he's a robot. So. That kind of ruins things, eh? But whatever. <laughs> okay. 
I guess. Yeah. Um, Mike, yeah, why don't you describe Dum Dum Dugan's appearance? Because I think he's a pretty cool looking fella. Well, his key feature is his red mustache, right? Uh, sure. Yeah. And red hair. I mean, that's how I, you know, notice, yeah. like, you know, think of him. Like but, a big uh, old handlebar mustache. Yeah. Yeah. And red yeah. hair. And I mean, other than that, he's, I mean, he's got like, what kind of hat is that? The bowler. Bowler it's, hat. Yeah. He always bowler. wears the bowler hat. Right. Yeah. And then other than that, the rest of him is pretty standard, right? Yeah. But that's a distinctive look with the mustache and a bowler hat. Okay. It's yeah. Good. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Miles Lawson, like... did you ever wear a bowler hat? I have never <laughs> worn a bowler hat. I have never worn a bowler hat. I, <laughs> it's pro- still, probably I the don't, best. I, I, until now, the, the the thought never really entered my head. I mean, <laughs> well, now it has. And you'll be I have wearing. a giant head, so it would have to be custom made. All right. Well, that's my. I guess that's about all I got to say about this. Um, <laughs> they, as far as background info goes, We'll talk about the Deadly Dozen, because uh, this is Dum Dum Diggins' Deadly Dozen. We'll talk about them a bit later, because they, they're an interesting story after this. Uh, remind me to talk about them when we get through the issue. I don't want to spoil anything. All but, right. Uh, all right, Mike Elson, maybe let's just look at the cover. Sure. So we got Sergeant Fury, Marvel Comics stri- or group, the, the strip across the top, the ribbon. Then uh, we always talk about the corner box here. Instead of a box or a circle, we just have a disembodied head floating in whiteness, right? Yeah, well, that's negative. not just any disembodied head. Who is that? I'm like, oh. oh, that's right, because it's Nick Fury just pre-patch. That's right. Yeah. No eye patch for Nick Fury. Right. Uh, do you know when he got the eye patch? Well, I know it was before Agents of Shield. I just don't know when or why. Did they reveal that? Well, it was before Agents of Shield in like comic book timeline, but not in our timeline, because. All right, so Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos came out in 1963, and it was successful. And then uh, Stan Lee saw the success of, like, The Man from U.N.C.L.E. TV right. show and all the, all the James Bond stuff. So he wanted to come up with a spy thriller, and, it, and he knew that everyone liked Nick Fury. So he goes, hey, let's just use Nick Fury, like, you know, set in the future after he's done with the military. So that's what – and they gave him an eye patch for some reason to make him, <laughs> give, I guess, give him a different look. So then the, those stories and tells to – or strange tales were running already – the two books were running concurrently because they came out in 1965. So Nick Fury had an eye patch, but in this Howling Commando series, still no eye patch. So right. then, in issue 27 in 1966, they explain how he got it. Uh, a, a Nazi uh, grenade went off, kind of uh, off in, close to him, and it injured his eye. And he could have had a surgery to save his eye, his eyesight, but he said, "No, I don't. I'm not having a surgery. I gotta, you know, get back out in the field with my men." So the doctor told him, all right, your eye's going to heal, but you could lose your vision at any time. And he, it said he ended up losing it 20 years later. Mm. So there you okay. go. <laughs> okay. His eye hung in there for 20 years, but then it conked out at him right before he became the leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, do you know what the explanation was in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Yeah, he got scratched by a flurkin. Right. You got that right. <laughs> or a cat. Damn, yeah. I wasn't trying to impress you there. Okay. <laughs> So Miles, Miles, did you watch Ms. Mar- or, uh, yeah, Ms. Marvel, right? Oh, or Captain Marvel. Marvel. Captain Marvel. <laughs> did you watch Captain Marvel, the movie? Um, I did not finish it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Nick Fury, Nick Fury gets scratched by a cat at the end. So, yeah. Of course he does. That's and I'm sure the cat him. was a female cat. Oh, well, the cat was a, an alien called a Flergener. What's it? Is that it, Michael? Oh, Flair? I I can't remember. I only saw it once. Well, it wasn't great. <laughs> yeah, it was all right, but not so good. Yeah. Um. All right. So, uh, all right, Michael. Let's get back to the cover here, Sergeant. So, Fury yeah, and we've got. The, so yeah, Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. We've got this. Uh, what would you call this? A platoon? Yeah. No, a a command. A squadron. A squadron of people mm-hmm. coming over this hill. All guys. One gal. This is yep. these are this is obviously the deadly dozen, right? And at the bottom, it says, Dugan's Deadly Dozen. And what's unusual for this time is there's no text or speech bubbles or anything else. That is it's true. Just the, yeah. yeah, it's just a picture of them coming over the hill. And this is drawn by John Severin, the brother of Marie Severin. Ah, I was going to say it looked different from the interior. Okay. Yeah. Um, he, he did a lot of war books back in the day. Uh, Miles Watson, uh, what do you think of this cover? I'll be honest. I actually do kind of like this cover. It's it's very 
I mean, the artwork in and of itself is not, it's not great artwork, but I really like the dynamism of it, like the, the action, like you've got the explosion coming off the girl's arm behind her, you know, and her, her body is posed in an interesting kind of way, like she's shielding herself, but she's jumping, she's holding her carbine up, then you've got the wrestler, he's firing, you've got the guy with the headband, he's firing, with the bullet going through Dum Dum's hat, yeah. his poor bowler hat. Uh, You've got that black guy at the very top who looks like he's completely insane. He's got a grenade. <laughs> and a, gun. a grenade and a gun. And he has fucking had it, man. He is he is done. Whatever whatever is in his way today ain't gonna have a good day. Like you have that guy. I mean, it's just it's interest it's an interesting cover. It's not the you know, the artwork in and of itself is not brilliant, but there's something very like passionate and, and about mm-hmm. this uh this attack. I kinda yeah, like Yeah, the, the art's a little weird. It's like um it's kind of like uh, you can almost see a little McFarlane in it, and <laughs> the way like uh, Dum Dum's arm is shortened in his hand, that like you can see, oh yeah, McFarlane drew those fingers. But it also kind of looks like a uh, uh, like a Mad Magazine parody of a TV show or something like that kind of art style, <laughs> like the way well, some well, of the figures are. Again, not to harp on the black dude at the top, but if you look at his face closely, I see a lot of influence later on in Mike Tyson's Punch Out art from that. <laughs> And look at the guy to to uh, that fella's right. Um, he has an eye patch, but no one in the book has an eye patch. Mm, good point. Yeah, I noticed that, and I, I was wondering if that was like a shadow that was screwed up because at first I thought no, it's clearly an eye patch, and then I thought that's curious because Nick Fury's trademark is an eye patch, but he didn't get it at this time, so he still has right. two eyes. So I thought it was curious that they would have a soldier with an eye patch, but then when the comic began and they do that kind of murderer's row. Uh, yeah. lineup. I was looking and I'm like, I don't wait. I don't see it. It's not yep. there, and it isn't. Well, uh, I think this cover's pretty good. Uh, John Severn. It's funny because when you think about like the '60s Marvel artists, like Jack Kirby, John Buscema, uh, J- John Severn does not really fit in with them, right? But I think for a war book, his art's perfect. Like this is got kind of a grittiness to it, right? That's what I like about it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty yeah, good. it's not spectacular, but I think it suits the genre for sure. I think it's better than the interiors, personally. Hey, hey, Mike L. Oh, no, no, I like the interiors better. It's uh, We'll get into it. But, Mike L., um, do you have any idea why Dum Dum Dugan is called Dum Dum? No, I was going to ask you if you f- came across that in your research. Yeah, I, I tried to find a, like a definitive answer, and I could not find anything. Uh, some people are saying, well, there's dumb, dumb bullets, but I don't think that's why. Like, mm. um, the dumb, dumb bullets like expand and flatten, so they do more damage, but I don't think that's why they claim. I think it's just to play off his name, just dumb, dumb dig, and I, don't, I guess he's stupid. I don't know. <laughs> dumb, dumb dig. <laughs> I don't huh. know. I guess it's also some... kind of candy. Did you know that? Well, not back then, though, right? Uh, apparently, I'm just looking this up now. It started in 1924, so. Oh, well, there you go. Eh, it could be. Uh, but uh, some people were saying, well, he was a circus strong man, maybe dumbbells. Dumb, dumb dig. I don't know. I think yeah. the bullet explanation is the most logical because it's a bullet, right? And this is a war comic, so. I don't yeah, know. I, su- I suppose. But uh, you think that would be his signature, like he's using the dumb, dumb bullets, but I don't. Like when I I went back and looked at issue one and stuff, and no, there's no mention of it anywhere. Mm. They don't explain why he's called Dum Dum, but I don't know. Miles Watson, any theories? <laughs> why he's Dum Dum? <laughs> but I don't know. Could it be a, a reflection on his intelligence? Um, <laughs> that's, yeah, I know that's what we keep getting back to. Yeah, I don't know. Um, all right. So uh, all right, Michael, let's look at the big splash page. Miles already kind of mentioned it. Right, so yeah, we dive right in. Top secret, Dugan's Deadly Dozen. We got the credits here, edited by Stan Lee, written by Gary Friedrich, drawn by Dick Ayers, inked by Mike Esposito, lettered by Artie Simic. And we've got 12 pictures here that correspond to the 12 members of the team, right? Yep. So it's a splash page. It's an, it's an unusual one because there's no other text besides that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, it's just our photos in the... Uh rows of uh, four across uh three rows of four right. and they alternate the background panels uh the colors alternate yellow and red i didn't notice so, that yeah and yeah the artist is dick airs but like it, it's a very old school like silver agey kind of style like almost like a dick tracy comic book the art yeah they're uh, yeah slightly exaggerated caricatures <laughs> yeah they all look very different uh, we got the uh, 11 dudes and one blonde 
blonde yep. lady. Got to throw in a smoking hot blonde. <laughs> so yeah, and we should also point out there's two black dudes and one Asian guy. And uh, Miles, I don't know if you know his bottom right corner, also uh, Fred Gwynn of Herman Munster fame. You notice that guy? Good Lord, no. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's Fred Gwynn. How about that? So, all right, uh, page uh, one, then we get uh, Dum Dum talking to his uh, captain. So, yeah, so we'll get to this later, but this story is in sequence, but kind of out of sequence, but we'll get that get to that in a minute. Because there's sort of a flashback, right? Oh, there is a flashback, yes. Yes, yes. We'll talk about that later, though. So, basically, Dum Dum Dugan is talking to this guy, and he's like, why are you showing me these pretty pictures, you know? And what's this about Dugan's deadly dozen, you know? And he's like, well, it's top secret. You know, we got a mission for you. And Fury is out. Which, at this point in the story, I don't think they had explained that yet. Like, the readers did not know why or what was going on. But he's like, yeah, well, Fury, right? If they read the previous issue, they would know. That's what I'm saying. I think the... I don't think so. I think the flashback explained it for the first time. Really? We'll get to, yeah, I think so. But we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see how it's played out. Uh, so, yeah, he's like... Um, so, we, we've got a new command group waiting to start fighting, and you're going to ramrod them. So basically, he's telling uh, Dum Dum. I don't know what that. That's means, not as dirty as it sounds. Yeah, he's telling Dum Dum Dugan he's not going to be part of the Howling Commandos. Now he's going to be part of the Dugan's Dirty Dozen. And so now we go through the team again with different pictures, and each of them having an explanation. And this time it's uh, two kind of you know not splash pages, but two big pages in a row with a little bio of each member. Are we going to go through each member? Uh, I guess we can mention them, but uh, yeah, behind each member, there's like an American flag, and uh, right. there, there's six on each page. Uh, why don't we just, uh, let's just maybe just go our favorites. Miles, do you have a favorite of the Deadly Dozen? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, I know, it's a tough call. But, uh, I did kind of like the, uh, the, the crazy black dude. <laughs> I was fond of him. Um, <laughs> That would be the, the woman, you know, Michael Bullseye Miller. Michael Bullseye Miller. Yeah. You know, I, I couldn't help but notice, not to get on a side tangent here, but both the black characters are in for stealing. Yeah, I noticed, that. I noticed that too. And, and, and the yeah, Asian yeah. character is a self-defense instructor. Of <laughs> course he is. Uh-huh. That's right. You know, because he's Asian. Uh-huh. So therefore he must know karate or kung fu. Right, right, right. Well, wait a minute. He's not, uh, Michael Bullseye Miller's not in for stealing. He was busted to private, serving sense for manslaughter following a fight over no. name calling. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I wonder what the name calling Which, yeah, it's implied, I guess, implied that maybe the, that he was called a name that he didn't, you know. Yeah. The that, other, the other, uh, the other black fella, Jake Jensen, he was busted for uh, theft yeah. and he's a pickpocket. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm going to say, I was curious about this. The guy, um, the Donald Sample, lieutenant busted to private serving life sentence for conspiring to steal government secrets. Yes. And it says he's married, his wife resides in Boston, former professional artist and military draftsman prior to court martial, good prior to court martial. Okay, he was given a life sentence for stealing military secrets. To what end? The only reason to steal military secrets is to sell them to the enemy. No. So, yeah. Why, why would they give him a chance to be part of a commando unit <laughs> if he's stealing military secrets? Who's he going to sell it to, other than maybe Russia? Who's he going to sell it to in World War II? The Nazis. Besides the Germans <laughs> and the Japanese. Yeah, he's going to sell them to the Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone deserves a second chance, Miles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think they kind of like. We know, you kinda, the, we know you sold those A bomb plans to Hitler, but <laughs> we're going to give you a second chance. Yeah. You know. Oopsie. Yeah. A do over. <laughs> but uh, he kind of looks like Salvador Dali. He's got like a big old yeah. mustache. Uh, I think they kind of drawn him like Salvador Dali a little bit. But, uh, uh, Michael, do you have a favorite of the d- Deadly Dozen? Yeah, I've decided my favorite is Larry Hillbilly Wagner. <laughs> Larry Hillbilly Wagner. Yeah. Is he the guy who's always drunk? Yeah, let's see here. He's a country and western singer. What's that? 
Oh, uh, yeah, for constant uh, intoxication. That's what yeah. he was serving a sentence for. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's divorced. Oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, he speaks yeah. German. He speaks German fluently and has great rapport with people. So mm. that's good. Uh, my my favorite of the group is obviously Lori Livingston. Uh, she's a yeah. British citizen serving sentence for theft from U.S. Army supply depots. She's a resident of London, England. She's single. Hey, so you got a mm, chance, Dum Dum. Wait, yeah. Dum Dum's married. I forgot because his wife is back in Boston. When Fury first met him in Europe, he's like, "What are you doing over here in Europe?" He goes, "Well, my wife's back in Boston, so I'm here." <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, serv- uh, sing- service record none. Recommended for assignment. Uh, she speaks ten languages fluently and could be obvious. Could have obvious value to command squad. And she's also a smoking hot blonde. Mm-hmm. You want to have those around. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, war zone. Yeah. So, all right. So that's the. We also got like a wrestler in here, like a professional wrestler. Yeah, and, he's uh, the funniest looking guy I think. Hey, Ralph <laughs> Haas Cosgrove. Yep. Yeah, he's pretty good, and uh, he, he's uh, his sentence is for assaulting an officer. Right. And, and the two uh, Howling Commando guys are Percival Pinkerton and Dino Morelli. And I'm sure they mean, or Dino Manelli. And I'm sure they mean a lot to the Howling Commandos fans out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't really know too much. But yeah, all right. So there, there's a brief overview of the Deadly Dozen. All right, Michael, let's, let's resume the big story. All right. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, What's his name? So now the what's this guy? Who's he talking to again? Uh, that's his captain. He's the guy who's in charge of the Howling Commandos. Uh, captain okay. Samuel Happy Sawyer. Hap Sawyer. They call right. Him. And I love his dialogue. There they are, Corporal. What do you think? Roughest bunch of dog faces ever assembled, I'd say. Roughest bunch of jailbirds be more like it. So basically, Dum Dum is is not happy with this idea, right? He's not really convinced yet. And uh, the captain's like. <laughs> so this is funny. He's like, well, it ain't going to work because I ain't going to do it. And then the captain's like, oh, yes, you are, you stubborn old jackass. And I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> you'd rather do it than wind up in the hoos- what is it? Husco? The Huscow. The Huscow. Huscow. What's that? Just a term prison. for prison. Oh, okay. The Huscow yourself for disobeying orders. So then he blows some uh, pipe smoke in his face. So then Dum Dum's like, okay, fine. So he storms out. He's like, but I don't have to like it. So then, yeah, okay, so no, this is kind of weird. So then Dum Dum Dugan goes to sleep. And he has a dream that flashes back to the end of the previous issue's story, apparently. Yeah, yes, and, uh, I went back and checked, and this, like, obviously the next, the previous issue was ninety-seven, but that was a reprint because they're. Ah, uh, okay. But okay. if you go to issue ninety-six, these are the events in issue ninety-six. Oh, okay, 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 gotcha. I thought it was just revealed for the first time, but I guess not. Okay, so Dum Dum is dreaming, is flashing back to being um, on this hill. With, with the other Howling Commandos. And he is... Oh, they're, they're trying to get Nick Fury up to the top of the hill because Nick Fury's been shot, right? Yeah, he's at the bottom with uh, someone else, some blonde-haired dude, I don't know. Right. <laughs> I don't know the other Howling Commandos. I, I'm just familiar with the Deadly Dozen. Right, right. So they got... Uh, what's his name? Nick Fury in this, like, whatever this is called. Um, like a field bed thing that's, like, tied to some rope. And they're trying to get him up to the top of this hill. And so they're... <laughs> <laughs> they're pulling him up, and there's like a, there's a couple of silent panels of him being pulled up, and they're trying to hide him with like these like smoke bombs or whatever. But the Germans are shooting at them, and we can see like the the bullets hitting the side of the rock, sit, hitting the hill, hitting the rock. And then um, you know, Dum Dum's like, "It's no use. The smoke screen's as good as gone." And when they open up on us with the tanks, they won't do again if we move fast enough. I figure these two smoke grenades will cover us just long enough to scale the cliff. So then he throws those, uh, and then he's like, son of a gun, you know, you ain't bad for a flyboy, that is. Now, if only they, they get the surge up in time. So, sure enough, they do. And then uh, these two uh, climb up to the top of the hill, and just or they start to climb up to the top of the hill. And just as that's happening, the German tanks come. But it's funny, because they make no indication these are German tanks. Well, I guess there's Nazi. Yeah, they do. Swiss <laughs> but they don't yeah. speak, they're speaking English, though, you know. There should have been at least those little brackets or something, you know. That would have well, been nice. Do you think it's because they got the jagged lines underneath the speech balloons? Like that uh, means it's German. I think <laughs> like that it's a lightning not, bolt. <laughs> I think that means they're talking through a radio. That's what that usually yeah. means, as far as I know. That's, right. what, I, that's what I assumed. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so Dugan makes it up to the hill, but his other fella gets killed. Right. The tanks kill him. So yeah. D- Dugan's having this nightmare because the one time he's in charge of a squadron, he gets one of his men killed, and now he's in charge of the deadly dozen. So right. he's freaking out. Right. 
internal conflict, Miles Watson. That's what that is. Internal conflict. Well, it's caused by the fact that he went to sleep with his hat on. Yeah. <laughs> I also like that his hat, always, like, if you know, they always draw, like, bullet holes in the top of it, and it's all, like, roughed up and stuff on the top. Right. Uh, yeah. Taking a beating, this bowler hat. So. Yeah, so this is where Dum Dum wakes up from his, well, he gets woken up from his dream. And somehow this guy knows what he's dreaming about. He's like, we already been through well, all that. At what point in you re- you're rehashing it in your dreams? Well, I think he was yelling in his sleep. Okay. All right. So then, yeah, so he's all lamenting what, how bad of a leader he is, and they're all trying to make him feel better. And then in the last panel, we get this. Because let's be clear, I know Dick Ayers because he's a Kirby inker, and this last panel here is clearly a Kirby-esque you know, shot of a guy's face, Dum Dum's face with tears coming out of his eyes. And he's like, thanks, guess I needed to hear that. But that's enough wet nursing for one night. Tomorrow, most of you are going to be on your own. So get out of my sight before I start getting the idea I'm going to miss you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he's leaving the Howling Commandos behind, but he's taking those two guys with him, uh, Dino mm-hmm. and uh, Percival. Right. And we should mention Percival's a British guy. So they always have him carrying an umbrella, and he's wearing an ascot. Right. And he's got like a red beret with a beanie on top. <laughs> right. It's pretty awesome. It's <laughs> So then, uh, so yeah, what happens? You don't even remember. What, I just read this and I don't remember what happens next. What's the, what's the <laughs> well, scene? they go to meet the captain and the because to find out what you know the deadly dozen and all that, they're going to meet the deadly dozen. So. Oh, right, right, right. So yeah, they're they're talking about it and then yeah, they unveil them behind this curtain. <laughs> Miles, how long do you think they're standing behind that curtain? <laughs> the rest of the deadly dozen. Um, I, I think the deadly. You have you have to give the deadly dozen credit for the discipline of staying quiet enough. <laughs> yes. That, right. Right. You know, that when he unveils the deadly, because they're in a fucking room that's like, it's just a slot. Like, there's, <laughs> there's, there's nothing in the, like, there's nothing in the back. It's like a, a little closet with a curtain yeah. in front of it. And it had to be hot and uncomfortable in there. And they had to be quiet. It's, you know, an impressive you display they, of discipline. From the what government. do you think they keep in that closet when they're not, they don't have nine soldiers standing out? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't even want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> but it's pretty good. Yeah, they're just standing there. Good old soldiers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then, so, yes. Then, uh, yeah, so the captain's kind of hyping them up, right? What were we going to say, Mike Dell? Well, no, but yeah, it just he explains. Uh, it's like Dum Dum's still reluctant to take this assignment. Right. Mm-hmm. But uh, Sawyer's trying to like make sure he does. Yeah. yeah, he's like, we've got a mission for you in 15 days. If you can't pull it off, the entire Allied effort may go down the drain. And then Dum Dum's like, sure, it's a relief to know that's all you expect of me, Captain. There was a minute, there, there for a minute, I was afraid you wanted me to pull off some kind of miracle. <laughs> so then basically, <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, Miles, though, uh, look at the bowler, because he's normally a corporal, so he's just got the two, star- the two stripes on the that's bowler. Right. Mm-hmm. But look, Sergeant Dum Dum. Yeah, they're giving him the three stripes now. He's, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Now, do you think he's, he's his own out. seamstress? Like, he stitches those on himself? Or... I, I just like the fact that he had the initiative to put stripes on a bowler hat. Like, he militarized. <laughs> yeah. He's already wearing some kind of, like, uh, it's really something out of an Australian movie like Mad Max. Those stripes on his sleeves remind me of Dexie's Midnight Runners or something. I, it's like, I, yeah, I don't he's... know how to categorize the, the shirt that he's wearing underneath. But then he's got the bowler, so... He's well, he was a, a circus. Man. He was a circus strongman, Miles. So I think that's the circus strongman outfit underneath. Right, and and it's natural that once you're in the army, you would continue yeah. to wear your circus strongman <laughs> outfit course. under your uniform. I mean, of course, yeah. Like I'm if you were an accountant, they would definitely I'm wearing want mine to wear right your now. under your fatigue. Yeah. yeah. So now we see Dum Dum trying to whip him into a shape, Michael. And oh, here's your favorite guy, the drunkard, right? Oh, the hillbilly. Yep. So this is funny. So yeah, he's like, uh, you know, this is the classic scene we see in a lot of war movies, which was probably best done in Full Metal Jacket. This one doesn't quite achieve those heights, but it's still good. Well, because they had this to work off of. So they were able to Oh, uh, yes, right. And issue 98 of Howling Commandos, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then I love this. So he's like, let me tell you something. It may be a way out. Oh, wait. So he's like, okay, you blasted gold bricks. So you signed up for an out of, for an, Easy way out of the pen. Well, let me tell you something. It may be a way out, but it sure and thunder ain't going to be easy. And I'm to prove that to you starting right now. Ten hut. And then we get the hillbillies like, really, Sergeant? 
I'm used to sleeping until at least noon. This would be me in the army, by the way. This is <laughs> you hold it down a little bit. So yeah, Dum Dum's not impressed with this guy. So basically, he threatens to take away his guitar, but then the one black guy, you know, steps in and and then and then Dum Dum pushes his face out of the way. Uh, this is great. I mean, I, we could just read the, all this dialogue because it's all awesome, but we don't read it that kind of time. But so basically, then this guy starts playing his guitar. Oh yeah, so he starts playing his guitar. This is when Dum Dum takes threatens to take it away, right? And yeah. and then uh, the hillbilly's like, "Yeah, uh, wait, don't do nothing like that, neighbor. That's the box I use. That's the box I used first time I sang on the on the Opry. Means a yeah. lot to me. Let me keep it, and I swear I won't give you no more back talk." You, so you know he, what the the Opry is, Michael? Yeah, the Grand Ole Opry. Ah, there you go. I was a Canadian. Oh, I wasn't sure yep. if you know that. Oh yeah, I used to watch that as a kid. <laughs> so that yeah, they show him do, going through these obstacle courses and stuff. And uh, Miles, I just noticed in the one panel they're going over the wall, and Percival has his umbrella popped open like Mary Poppins <laughs> so going over the wall. <laughs> I didn't even know how to deal with that one. I mean, it, it, clearly these guys want to, you know, they're very colorful. Yes. <laughs> and Miles, next up is the lady, Lori Livingston. Uh, she has an encounter with Dum Dum. Would you like to explain what happens there? <laughs> I would like to explain it because this was the part of the comic that I think achieves, I believe the word, I'm going to bust out a fancy word here, is called apotheosis. Whoa. The ultimate, the absolute. When they have a little discussion about what might be called feminism here, because <laughs> Dum Dum is ridiculing her because, you know, he's like, you worried you're going to mess up your latest fashions. And, you know, and then she is like, I'm afraid this training program is not for ladies. I mean, <laughs> I feel women are equal to men, but there are just some things women shouldn't have to. And then she gets that far and he hurls her face first <laughs> into the water and she goes, oh, and her legs are up in the air and he's forget it, sister. If you volunteered for a man's job, you'll do it the same way a man does, which That's is right. great because the first half and the second half of his declaration here are two worlds uh, simultaneous. The second part is there ain't going to be no sex discrimination in this outfit, which is fascinating because the first part of his sentence is like, if you volunteered for a man's job, you'll do it the <laughs> same way a man does. He's practically spitting tobacco juice here. He's like, I'm going to be a misogynist and a feminist in the same panel. It's really it is pretty impressive. An incredible yeah. moment in comic book history because you can't you can't classify this one little panel as one thing or the other. He's like, I'm not going to discriminate against you and then he throws her in the water and basically tells her I I I I'm in awe. Dum Dum rose to a higher level here. Uh, no. <laughs> Now, Miles, I can't remember the Dirty Dozen. I never saw the whole thing. I just saw clips. But I'm pretty sure there was no women involved, right, in the Dirty Dozen? There were uh, no women in the original Dirty Dozen. I will say yeah. that they made a number of sequels to the Dirty Dozen with the, you know, revolving character, uh, revolving actors, um, mostly TV movies. And I think by the time they got to, like, the fourth, th they, they replaced Lee Marvin with Telly Savalas, and they made him <laughs> TV, TV movies. They were TV movies, and they're pretty bad. You know, they're like fun, kind of fun, stupid movies. They were totally unrealistic, uh, beyond even what you would expect. But one of them had Heather Locklear. Ooh, wow. Yeah, Heather Locklear was a member of one of the Dirty Dozen. Again, uh, they films. probably ri they yeah. ripped off this issue. They said, "Oh, <laughs> someone someone around the office is reading issue ninety eight yeah. of the Howling Commandos. Let's get a smoking yeah. hot blonde." So the next, I think, I think. I think Lee Marvin may actually have been alive for some of them, and then he died, and they replaced him with with Telly Savalas. Uh, it was a, this hey, is a long time ago. Um, hey, we're talking in the eighties here. Next up, after the lady goes in the drink, it's your buddy Miles Bullseye, the crazy guy that you like, and uh, he's not shooting so good. So uh, Dum Dum says, "Here, give me that dang rifle." And look at Dum Dum's technique on the firing here, uh, Miles. Is that how you would like to shoot a rifle by your hip? Well, he, you know, the fact that he's doing it one-handed, I think he's he's uh, and his other hand's out there for balance. He's definitely showing off here. Dum Dum yeah. is 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 basically saying, you know what? If you can't lift this weapon and <laughs> put a tight 
fucking cluster of bullets into the X ring yep. of the bullseye. You don't belong in Dugan's uh, dirty du- or excuse me, <laughs> Dugan's dozen. dirty dozen. I just got it. <laughs> Sorry, Dude, Dugan's deadly dozen has certain marksmanship standards. Yeah. So he uh, he tells Bullseye, "You better pick it up, buddy." And then uh, next, they oh, and Mike L. Next is the wrestler, the pro wrestler guy challenges Duke and do a to a fight, basically. Yes, this is uh, one of my favorite scenes. Uh, basically, yeah. So they kind of um, hold on a sec here. I, I flipped away for a second, but um, so basically he comes up to me and he's like, um, he's like, uh, you know. He's like, now which one of you wants to try me first? I do. That is if you promise you won't send me back to jail for tearing you apart. Mister, you put me down and I'll give you my stripes, right? So basically then we, it's cool because we have a couple, oh, and then the couple of the guys bet on who's going to win. Then we have a, a couple more silent panels. Uh, so the wrestler puts him in a, what's that called? A, a full Nelson, yeah. right? And then uh, Dum Dum Dugan just flips him over, and <laughs> yeah. that's it. That's the end of the fight. The guy lands on his back. Dum Dum Dugan s- puts his foot on his chest. He's like, now, anybody else want to try me, or are you ready to learn self-defense my way? And then we see the guys in the back paying off. That's kind of cool. That's a good detail. Did you yeah. notice that? I did not until you pointed yeah, it Yeah, I just noticed it right now. But uh, so then... Um, so then, yeah, so then basically uh, they're pretty much finished up their training. <laughs> they're ready for their mission. Yep. And, uh, oh, yeah, oh, oh, and now now Sergeant Fury is waking up out of, because, you know, he was injured in that battle. So, uh, so what's his name? So they wrap up the uh, the session here. They send, they're like, yeah, we're going to meet again at uh, whatever 100. And then Dum Dum Dugan and the two other Howling Commandos go to visit Sergeant Fury in the hospital. And they're kind of just joking around about how he has a cigar, but cigar, but no light, blah, blah, blah. Nothing really comes out of this. They kind of just chat. Um, well, I think, uh, I'll say, uh, well, I guess he's, does he say something like you can do it or something? Or No, I don't think he does. does Not he? really, no. <laughs> yeah, kind of a weird scene. That's the, they didn't even mention the, the Deadly Dozen. Yeah, I think they're just uh, giving you an update on Fury to let you know that he's all right. Right, right. So then, yeah, we pretty much cut. Now they're on the mission, right? And they're look. Uh, Dum Dum is looking through some binoculars uh, at like uh, w- whatever. See the oh, this is uh, they're in England, right? So this is the uh, what is this the? Uh, I think it's the uh, Lake Strait. Michigan. Yeah, it's Lake Michigan. <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, and uh, and it's like there it is, just like a G two said, a raft full of kraut spies. Figure on making it into England easy as slurping some some lager. So basically, yeah, they're kind of just getting ready for the Germans to uh, come to shore here. But they don't want to kill any of them. They oh, right. They have them. to keep them alive. That's right. Yeah. For questioning. But let me uh, pause here because uh, Miles Watson writes some incredible battle scenes mm. in Sinner's Cross. Really vivid, uh, like, you know, graphic, gritty, mm. violent war scenes. Miles, how do you feel like this? Uh, battle scene coming up captures the feel of authentic war. I think it's pretty close. <laughs> I I uh, I think that um, okay. Let me put it this way. Imagine you wanted to teach uh, an alien about cats and mice. <laughs> okay. I like where this. And is you going. showed them a Tom and Jerry cartoon. <laughs> yes. The actual relationship of a real life relationship of cats and mice. Yeah. It bears about as much relationship to to anything that could possibly have happened as a Tom and Jerry cartoon does to reality. This you is have, amazing, though. You have, okay, first of all, you've got the, it's England, right? The Germans are taking a raft across the English Channel. Mm-hmm. The, the Americans know the raft is coming somehow because intelligence knows that there's going to be German spies who are coming to England, right? Now, these German spies are paddling across the English Channel, which, of course, you know, isn't patrolled and there aren't, you know, the beaches aren't fortified and there aren't fucking planes and obstacles, barbed wire, landmines and every other thing. But when this is my favorite part, when the Germans land on the beach, they are wearing German uniforms. What the hell kind of spy (laughs) land in in a foreign country? They're using reverse yeah. psychology, Miles. Yeah. <laughs> they're, wearing, they're wearing their actual German uniforms and helmets 
And then, of yeah. course, when they're under attack, they scream Americaners because it's natural <laughs> to assume that they're being opposed by Americans as they land on the shores of Britain in their <laughs> German uniform. To spy. What the hell were they going to spy on in their German, German uniform on the, on the cliffs of Dover? <laughs> that's, what that's were they going to spy point. on? Fair point. How are they going to like just hang out in their German uniforms and be like, hey, <laughs> don't pay any attention to us? <laughs> but <laughs> the no best thing, though, this. is uh, so the battle ensues and like we get little sequences of each member of the Deadly Dozen taking out a enemy combatant. And they do it yeah. in like the most ridiculous way possible. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> the, the one, the, I just have to say this because I've been waiting all night to say this. <laughs> My favorite one, because it just takes the thing into such a height of monstrous absurdity, is the, the guy with the playing card. Yes. I, tell you what, <laughs> the last... Bert, I have nothing against you and you have nothing against me. <laughs> so why not indulge in a friendly game of cards instead of trying to kill each other? And, of course, the German, instead of shooting him out of his fucking boots right then and yep. there in the middle of this hand-to-hand combat, he puts his gun down and takes a card out of the deck Yep. and then takes a careful look at it, taking his eye away from the opponent and thus getting a Kazakh, a left <laughs> uh, cross across the chin, which knocks him out, which is also funny <clears throat> because this is a really treacherous thing to do because here's the guy coming at him with a, with a message of universal brotherhood, like, yeah. Basically saying, in, in real world terms, he's saying, look, war is ultimately ridiculous because you're taking a bunch of complete strangers and forcing them to kill each other over some vague political ideal that they may or may not understand. That has always been the knock on industrial war, right? Modern war, any type of war. People don't actually have a beef with each other. They're just killing each other. Mm-hmm. This guy's like, hey, man, why are we fighting? And the German... Is actually thinking the same thing at this moment. He's like, yeah. "Fuck! Why, are, <laughs> why are we fighting with my wife and kids?" I, I like card tricks. Inventing... <laughs> he, this, guy, this German, this German was literally about to cure cancer in his homeland when he was taken <laughs> yeah. and he was sent on this mission. Right. And he's like, "Maybe I could go back and cure cancer." And then he gets knocked out yeah. for embracing I... universal brotherhood. If he wasn't a Nazi before, he'll be one when he wakes up. <laughs> and after he and after he picks the ace of hearts, that's a pretty good uh, card. And then, he, and then he gets knocked out. Boom. Mm-hmm. And not only does he get knocked out, Miles, but as soon as he hits the ground, our other buddy who's the pickpocket goes over and steals his wallet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. So the black guy, the black guy, <laughs> he goes to One fucking steal the guy's wallet. And the best part is having made the black dude be the thief, the German who come, comes up behind him doesn't shoot him. He tells him to halt. Now, yeah. the Germans, there's only, like, there's only like 12 of these Germans, right? So they know they can't be in like a battle. This isn't the invasion of Normandy. This is a little commando squad of Germans, right? They've come there to be spies or whatever, sabotage something. This guy doesn't shoot the son of a bitch in the back of the head <laughs> in the middle of this frenzy. He tells him to halt. What's he going to do? Take him prisoner? Walk him back to the raft? Yes. They're going to paddle back to France right. and then to the fatherland. Like, this, <laughs> well, makes he's, less, this makes less sense than the playing card scene, if well, that's he's, possible. Well, he's hoping he can steal him a boat. <laughs> so that's why he's yeah. going to keep him alive. He's like, but, the black soldier is a natural thief. <laughs> he will but leave our, me back to city. But our pickpocket buddy, he has, he's not only a pickpocket, he also has a steel plate in his head, and he uses it to knock the rifle out of the German's hand. <laughs> That's so yeah, good. This is, this is something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mike, Mike L., uh, your favorite buddy, the drunken country western singer, he uh, he cracks a guy with his guitar like the honky tonk man. Right, I noticed that. Yeah, <laughs> like the honky tonk man. Did I mention <laughs> I interviewed the honky tonk man? Did I tell <laughs> yes, you that? You did. Yeah, okay. yeah, you did. Right. And uh, then a German uh, soldier sneaks up behind my girl Lori Livingston, and he is surprised when he grabs her by her her golden hair and spins her around, and hits a woman. In, even though she's wearing like a, uh, her uh, army shirt is tied up at the belly, so you can see her midriff, and <laughs> he, he couldn't recognize her silhouette as a woman, you know. But uh, <laughs> right. he's like, "Oh, uh, now they're sending ladies to fight us," uh-huh. and she just beats the hell out of him. And then the wrestler guy just picks up like a dude and spins him over his head and throws him into some other dudes. And uh, now, yeah. do you remember when you said GI Joe was like a fake war comic? <laughs> I... This is- 
this is real to life, Michael. This yeah. is how it went down. Okay, okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> well, I do, I do like that down. the Germans are speaking English as they fight the right. uh, Americans. As I said earlier, oh, yes. Prepare to die, try and hunt. Like, why would you say prepare to die? Why wouldn't you just <laughs> fucking kill her? Right. Like, that's the problem with these Germans in this battle scene that's really bothering me, is that they always feel like they have to say something before they do anything. Prepare to die, Americans, come. Just <laughs> shoot the person. Right. Just shoot him. And, and let me make one correction. The wrestler doesn't pick up one guy above his head and spins him. He picks right. up one guy in each arm and spins two dudes over his head wow. and then throws him into four other dudes. Right. Another realistic scene. All right. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, they round up all the Germans. They arrest them all. And uh, we get another shot of the, the blonde girl with her, her, her top unbuttoned pretty much. And then <laughs> uh, the captain shows up and he says, hey, you think he's going to say, hey, good job, you guys. But that's not what he says, Michael. No, he says, I'll take over now. Looks like your job is finished. And he's like, uh, he's like, what did you do? Manage to get through a milk run without fouling up? So what? When they do something worthy of my praise, they'll get it. Until then, get these sorry excuses for soldiers out of my sight at double time. So he sends them all marching away. But then in his thoughts, he's like, hate to put them down that way, but I can't let them get overconfident. It makes me the heavy but I'll have to live with it in order to make them men enough to live through what's ahead for the deadly dozen. Well, man mm-hmm. enough and woman enough. Come on, don't leave out. Oh, right. Yes. But here's <laughs> the thing. Now, when you're reading this, you're like, well, this is kind of weird that they're just bringing in the deadly dozen in one random issue of the Howling Commandos. But if you think back to the, you know, your sitcom history, a lot of times they would introduce these strange characters out of nowhere. And what were they trying to do? Like, remember on Welcome Back, Cotter Miles, when they did, like, two episodes with Horshack's family? Uh, what is this about? Oh, they're setting up a spinoff. That's what they're doing. So that's uh-huh. what they were doing yeah. with the Deadly yeah. Dozen. They spin the Deadly Dozen off into their own series called Combat Kelly and the Dirty and the Deadly Dozen. Really? So, uh, yeah. Because I've heard of Combat Kelly. Okay, I didn't know what that was. Yeah, now if I can only find my notes about it, I could tell you all about it. <laughs> Um, and that is in TV world. That is called a backdoor pilot. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> um, do, do, do I know I have notes here about combat Kelly and I well, cannot find as them, you're looking, but... I'll just tell you what I know because I'm reading it off of MarvelFandom.com. Yeah, it lasted nine issues from 1973 to 1974. Boom. <laughs> oh, but uh, actually, you know what? I didn't realize Combat Kelly was previously. It was already a series, right? Like it was another. It was a character from before. I don't was he? Yeah, it says Combat Kelly, November nineteen fifty one. But you know what? Maybe this wasn't Marvel. Yeah, because because I read the first issue of Combat Kelly, and they kind of just introduce him, um, like Dum Dums there with the Deadly Dozen, and then they bring in huh. this Combat Kelly guy. He's a former pro boxer, Miles, who got in trouble for murdering a dude <laughs> fighting. Oh, so, huh. so they send him uh, to uh, lead the uh, Deadly Dozen. And here's the thing: it only lasted nine issues. And by the end of issue nine, everyone in the squadron is dead except for Combat Kelly and Lori Livingston. They all get murdered. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Like in the, at the final, it, in the final issue, Lori's like kidnapped by some Nazi scientist. He wants to do some experiment on her. And the experiment that he wants to do is he wants to sever her Achilles tendons and replace them with metal wires for some reason. <laughs> That's what he wants to do. Wow. I know. So he he starts the experiment. He severs her Achilles tendons and he cripples her. And everyone else, while they're trying to save Lori, they all get murdered except for Combat Kelly. He rescues her and he quits the army then. He tells Captain Sawyer, he's like, I'm out. I'm done. I, I lost all my men. Fuck the army. I'm out. And he takes Lori and they uh, live. They retire together and he takes care of her and they, they live together as a couple the rest of their days. So how about that? Wow. 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 Yeah. So all, all these guys that you liked in this book, they're all dead. By the end of the <laughs> hey. Wow, that's the first realistic thing that this comic produced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty dark, man. Combat Kelly and the Deadly Dozen. So, uh, all right, there you go. That's the big issue. Um, uh, we mentioned it's written by Gary Friedrich. We, we covered him when we did the uh, Ghost Rider. That's way right. back he, around episode seven or something. He's the co-creator, I believe, right? Yeah, and he wrote, so he wrote 47 issues of the Howling Commandos. Huh. Between issues 42 and 116 from 1967 to 73. 
But because uh, I think they only had like two or three. I think it was like Stan Lee, then uh, Gary Friedrich, and I think maybe one other guy wrote some issues. But that's about it. Hmm. Um, trying to see uh, Roy Thomas, our boy Roy was also yeah, there. Roy the boy. But uh, so, what did you think of the writing here, Miles? Um, I gotta be honest. I gotta be brutally honest. I gotta be as brutally honest as Dum Dum was with the deadly <laughs> dozen. Uh, th- this was an unusually low and hackneyed. Uh-huh. Yep. Set of of words that spewed forth from his mouth. I mean, I'm not looking for anything grossly profound in in. Uh, Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commando story, and especially not when they're being led by Dum Dum Dugan. I I fully appreciate that he's not a genius, but I got to say that the the dialogue in this, with a couple of exceptions, is uh, is, is it's pretty bad. There, it, it's pretty it's pretty bad. Um, mm-hmm. There's nothing. There's just nothing there that's like I don't know. They they could have they could have taken this in a couple directions to make it a little funnier or maybe a little grimmer. I don't know. It's just like they sort of had this worn out bag of war movie cliches and they're just kind of spewing it. Um, I will say this. I did like that. Dum Dum is kind of uh, traumatically stressed from his last mission. Yeah. I actually yeah. did like that. Uh, yeah, I that, should, I should have said that or sooner. Um, that, 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 that I like. that's kind of my concern here. Like the tone is weird because you get that internal conflict of, of, uh, Dum Dum being scarred by losing a man on the previous mission, and and you're setting it up like you know, good premise there. But then by the end, in the big fight, we're getting card tricks, guys spinning dudes over their heads and throwing them, and banjos yeah. over the back. It's, it's like, cool. yeah, it's like two totally different books, like a comedy and a gritty mm-hmm. war yeah. thing. It's just I, it doesn't really work, <laughs> but it's funny though. I mean, a card trick right in the middle of a war. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> that that is where I just went. What? the hell is happening right. here what is happening here mike l hey, i think Rich, i think i'm sorry more. but mike l, i think i think that moment with the car trick that could be equal to the uh, captain midnight moment with the guy on the big bicycle oh I, yes I, that's that, that, that you're right about that <laughs> that's a previous issue we did miles but it was a classic moment but uh so mike l, what'd you what you think about the the writing here Are you Ooh, a fan of uh gary friedrich this was rough uh yeah like <laughs> Usually, even if we review comics that are really bad, there's sort of something, even the Dazzler, it's like, okay, it was terrible, but there's something that makes me want to read more. But this is maybe the one of the first ones we've read where there's nothing about it that makes me want to read more. You really? Know? Yeah, nothing. Wow. <laughs> I, like, I like Dum Dum. I check in that emotion. Yeah. <laughs> I'd read more Dum Dum. And yeah. also... I would I, not. This is terrible. Yeah, and I don't think the art's good either. Like, See, see I like the yeah, art. The art. <laughs> but see, I, I like, I like it in that it's a simplistic style of art. It's it's nineteen seventy. Again, this is Silver Age stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it doesn't age well. But I think for its time, it's pretty good. Like it's simple page of design, simple like six, seven panel pages, and uh, I think the storytelling is pretty good. A lot of little details, Michael, like the guys in the background paying off the right. bet, uh, Percival with the umbrella jumping over the wall. There's a lot of interesting little details he puts in. Um, so I don't have a problem with the art, but I can understand why some people would not like it because it is like, it's like a Dick Tracy kind of style, you know, it's well, kind of weird. to me, the thing is I, I, like I said, I know him as being an inker of Kirby's and so I can see like some Kirby influence here. The one thing I'll give it is it's clear. You can always tell what's going on. So it's clear storytelling. It's just that it just seems like an, a less, like an, like an uglier hackneyed version of like Jack Kirby. Right. And so like, oh yeah, it's obviously not Kirby, but right. it's. You know. Like if you if you kind of like squint, you can look at it and go, oh, "That's pretty good." But when you look at the details, like it's kind of <laughs> sloppy and you know, just it's just know. not very good. I enjoyed it. Uh, so the artist here is Dick Ayers, born nineteen twenty four, died two thousand fourteen. Sadly, uh, at the age of ninety, though, it's a pretty good run. Huh. Nine years old. Uh, during World War Two, he was an eighteen year old, and he enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Corps, and he was stationed in Florida, where he failed radar training school. So they sent him to art school for a month. And then he started doing art for the Air Corps Operations Division. So I don't know what he's doing, like maps and stuff. I don't know. Mm. Uh, during the late 1940s, Ayers went on to Pencil and Ink Western Stories for publisher Magazine Enterprises, where he co-created the original Ghost Rider character, Michael. Right. 
like the Ghost Rider was a cowboy, a ghost cowboy, and it started way back then. And then Mar- the copyright ran out, so then Marvel picked them up, and they did their version of that Ghost Rider. And then right. later we got our version of the Ghost Rider. Right, 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 right. Uh, 1952, Ayer started freelancing for Atlas Comics, which, uh, of course, would become Marvel. And as Mike L. mentioned, he was Kirby's inker on a bunch of Western and monster books because mm-hmm. this was, you know, when the superheroes weren't around. Uh, he took over Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos from Kirby with issue eight in 1964. And he had a 10 year run when he, in which he drew 95 issues. Of the Howling wow. Uh, he, was a two th- he was a 2007 inductee into the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame and a 2013 Inkwell Awards Joe Sinnott Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's for the Yankers. Nice. With that. Uh, he did a bunch of stuff, but mostly it was like old westerns and war story stuff. So, like, he didn't, he really didn't do any, like, superhero stuff that I saw. You know, it was mostly, uh, Howling Commandos was his big deal. You know? mm-hmm. So, Miles, how did you feel about the art? <laughs> I thought the art was terrible and, um, <laughs> awful. Oh, come on. Uh, uh, I will say this. I think, I think, Mike Dell, that, uh, Possibly being a Greensburg snob, you, um, you know, not 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 a gritty Torontoan um, would, would be able to make these subtle distinctions. I think like you're giving him credit for like the umbrella jumping over. That's a that's a good idea. Like I think the ideas visually were good. I think the execution sucked. I think that the, you're giving him credit for the idea that he had, but is shitty. I think his execution was shitty. Uh, yeah, the, listen. I, I really. Do I understand like what you're saying. Like yeah, I, I like understand what you're saying. This is a very no. simplistic style, and but I, I think it, I liked it. it. I found it charming in that it's an old school, like 1950s kind of art. You know, the, now granted, it's 1972, so they probably shouldn't be doing 1950s art in 1972. But you know, whatever. <laughs> it's what it is. That would have been a point at. that I was going to make, but I, I won't make that point. <laughs> I enjoyed looking at it. So, all right, uh, Michael, any other thoughts about the Howling Commandos? Oh, I don't know. I mean, there, there was at one point I was going to dedicate myself to reading like every single Marvel comic from like the 60s and 70s. <laughs> and this is another one I'm going to strike off my list, I think. I'm just not going to bother <laughs> with this series. <laughs> how, how dare you? <laughs> so what would you give it? One out of ten, Michael. Oh, this, ooh, this, this is near the bottom of my list of every comic we've reviewed. Wow. I, yeah, I don't think I can go higher than a three, honestly. And, <laughs> right. o- and it's a three only because I could understand what was going on. At least it was not confusing. <laughs> All right. Uh, Miles Watson, uh, what do you think? I'm going to give this, I'm going to generously give this a three and a half because <laughs> three and a half. I, I feel like I was going to give it a three, but I, I will say that, that some of, some of Mike Dell's comments have made me rethink a few things, but only to the tune of half a point. Um, <laughs> I feel like with the exception of his, his flashback to the previous episode where he's sort of traumatized, um, which incidentally takes up half the comic. So <laughs> we're really only left with the, with the training. I feel like this was just a worn out grab bag of, of cliches and old ideas. I didn't feel like there was anything in here that, I mean, I know, you know, we're talking about a pretty primitive comic, uh, <laughs> but I, I just feel like it's not necessary to, like, the, people who are hacks in any field can still <laughs> come up with kind of innovative, innovative ways of approaching their subject matter, you know? Like the guy, like William Gibson, who wrote the Shadow Pulp novels. I mean, if you read those things, they're pretty bad, but they're also, like Mike, Mike L. said earlier, there's... There's bad stuff that you still kind of want to come back for more because it's shitty, but it has charisma, mm-hmm. like a soap <laughs> opera, or mm-hmm. a lot of things that I like are shitty, but they have a certain <laughs> charisma to them where you're like, I'm gonna, I, I fuck it, I'm just, gonna, I'm gonna watch this again, and I don't care. Right. That, this was just like it was almost as if you 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 were making a YouTube like video about a war movie, and you decided that you were only going to use cliches. <laughs> Right, right, right. No original ideas. Yes. Right. So yeah, I just couldn't. I just couldn't. I couldn't. I could not get into it. Um, couldn't listen to it. The beat scene just ruined me. I, I mean, 
the guy spinning people around on his shoulders and the car. It's so, and... But it's so absurd, ridiculous that it's awesome. It's like, you know, a bad movie that's so bad, it's awesome. Like, that's, that's funny right. stuff. And if they kind of kept that going, like you said, though. Yeah, like If they I hear kept you. that, that yeah. theme going all the way through, I would have said, fuck it, I'm in for the ride. Like, you have to, right. sometimes you just have to embrace that kind of thing. Like, if something is just over the top and nonsensical, you just go with it, and you're like, I don't care. I'll, I'll take this ride, and I'll, you know, I'll pay my ticket, get the seat, and see where the roller coaster takes me. This but, starts uh, out as kind of like they're on a mission, and he's having flashbacks from the bad mission, and it's combat, and then he's got to train these guys. And, and then it turns into this, I don't want to say cartoon, but it turns into a Tom and Jerry cartoon at the end. Yes, very much so. Um, yeah, all valid points. And let, before I give you my score, let, let me just point out that um, shitty but with charisma is the tagline for this, this podcast. <laughs> there you go. pretty much what we go. But uh, well, l- I, listen. I was, I, was really, I was really talking about myself. <laughs> listen, all the points that you brought up, there are, there are, yeah, the art is, I can see how people would not like the art, but I did like it. Uh, yeah, the tone is way off here. Uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's absurd. <laughs> but I, I still liked it. I still had fun reading it. Um, so I, I'm going to go five. I'll go five out of ten. Huh. Right, okay. I, I just really like uh, seeing that old school art. Uh, I know you guys didn't, but I, I did. So. That, uh, from Mike, I had a genuine note of pain in it. <laughs> it a genuine note of pain in his voice. He hey, like, uh, uh, hey, uh, Miles. Uh, hey, Miles, you were mentioned all that pulp stuff. Uh, a few uh, weeks ago on here, we did an issue of Doc Savage. Yeah. Did you ever read, oh, ever read any Doc Savage? I did read Doc Savage, and it was funny because my brother was had a weird obsession with Doc Savage because he just didn't – he just thought it was really weird, the man of bronze. Like, he, he was very – he was very – disturbed almost by that weird combination of like the giant bronze body guy with that, that you know, like albino hair. Right. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. was, he was really sort of freaked out by that. I, I just think that aesthetic just, just bothered him. He just couldn't, couldn't wrap his head around it. <laughs> Doc Savage. Doc All Savage, right. man of bronze. Um, so Mike L, I guess next week it's your pick. Well, I'm going to try and restore some dignity to this podcast, <laughs> and uh, so we're we're going to go with uh, we're going to go back to DC. We're going to go <laughs> 80s, actually this is 70s, I think. But we're going to go with Fury of Firestorm, oh. number one. That might be get, 80s, actually. Right yeah, do you guys? Now. I think it is. Yeah, do you guys remember Firestorm? I used to buy Firestorm when I was a kid. I had a whoa, kid. get out of town. Miles yeah, Watson, I, do you remember Firestorm? Was Firestorm the guy with the flaming head? Yes. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, he was young and kind of like cocky and dumb and, and likable. Uh, right. Yeah, I remember Firestorm. Right. Yeah, I remember him. Well, I actually really liked him because he had those cool, like, atomic. Yes. Didn't he have, like, an atomic kind of thing that those, those, those um, I don't know how to describe that. But when he would do his hand blasts, it would have those loops. Right. Yeah, kind of, kind of like, like an like atom. Orbits. Like, right, like the orbits yeah. of the electron, yeah. Right, 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 right. That's it, the orbits of electrons. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, he was a cool character. Yeah. Very. And yeah. he was in the Super Friends cartoon for the last two or three seasons. Oh, I didn't even... Yeah. That's oh. how I first came across him, so... Yeah, I had a few issues. Um, but didn't he also, like, doesn't he merge brains with, like, a professor or something? Yes. So, te- so technically, it's a teenager and a professor that merge into one superhero body. That's what it is. Yeah. And when he's <laughs> Firestorm, the kid is kind of the body, and then the professor is, like, a disembodied head that just talks to him. <laughs> it's a very I'm cool concept. Like, stop being a dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why is up? All right. Uh, so we're going to do issue one, he said. Fury of Firestorm number. There's, there's a Firestorm yeah. number one. This is Fury of Firestorm number oh. one, and I sent you the link in Skype. So okay, thank you. All right, yeah. so Miles Watson, thank you, buddy, for coming back on number seven. You're in the lead. Seven. Yes, that's right. That's right. I, I, I but I feel, I feel the shadow of, of Jank. Upon me. <laughs> I, feel that, I feel that he won't accept this defeat, and he'll just be like, you know what? I am not going to lose to a guy with shitty charisma like Miles <laughs> Watson. I'm going to put that clown down. 
I feel uh, that this rivalry has only just begun. Oh, <laughs> that's all right. It's okay, weird. yeah, definitely. No, thanks for joining writing us. Than, than in the whole fucking comic we just read. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, so yeah, that was another classic episode of a shitty podcast with Charisma. <laughs> with Charisma. With Charisma. Yeah. There you go. Charisma. There you go. Yeah, wasn't there? Wasn't there an adjective before the uh, Charisma? Or did I miss that? No. Okay, uh, I missed that up. All right. So yeah, so uh, every week we uh, review a different Bronze Age comic. One week I pick, one week Mike Dell picks. You can find our episodes on Stitcher, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, under Comic Book Syndicate. You can also follow us on uh, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, or the Comic Book Syndicate website. So until next Tuesday, disperse! <laughs>